Hey everyone, James from the Flying Guillotine uh, YouTube channel here, bringing you another um, uh, discussion. Today I am going to be talking with myself, um, discussing Ringo Lamb. Uh, I have been doing a deep dive into his work in the past um, past few months, really, starting in December last year, and I've watched uh, pretty much all of his films. Uh, I've seen 20 of, and I, there's like two really early ones that um, you don't read a lot about that I've not seen, but other than that, I have seen everything starting from Aces Go Places 4 um, to, uh, to his final film, Sky on Fire. Uh, so I've seen a lot of his films in the past few months and wanted to just share some thoughts. I've shared a number of reviews already, Prison on Fire, Prison on Fire 2, uh, School on Fire, City on Fire, uh, Full Contact. There are reviews of those films up already. Um, but, um, I put all of his films in a list. I enjoy doing these sorts of exercises and just kind of graded them into different tiers, um, of how I felt about them. And so I'm going to go over that, um, at the end of this episode. Uh, but first, a little bit of background, uh, Ringo Lam, uh, part of uh, a really influential uh, generation of Hong Kong film mem uh, filmmakers, basically the baby boomers of Hong Kong, born during a really great time, I think, uh, to be involved in that film industry. And they're all really young uh, during sort of like this golden period where Ringo Lam was certainly at his height uh, in the 80s and the 90s. Um, so people like T Choi Hark, uh, John Woo, uh, Johnny Toe, who I guess is a little bit of a late bloomer uh, amongst those guys. And I guess you could even lump uh, some of those uh, martial artists like Sam Hung, uh, Jackie Chan into there as well. Um, and those people all uh, very based around Hong Kong. That's where they got their start. And uh, it's a generation of filmmakers that really could build off of what was going on in the previous generation, um, if we think about things that dominated the late 60s and 70s, stuff like the Shaw Brothers. So Hong Kong really had a strong infrastructure of uh, filmmaking there. And of course, filmmaking is a very collaborative art. So you're going to need uh, technicians and people that are really, really skilled at their craft in order to do that. So I don't think it's coincidence that we have um, all of these um, sort of like baby boomers uh, coming in and uh, using, uh, taking what's come before them, using that as influence and using that sort of cinema culture that existed in uh, Hong Kong and uh, creating something fantastic out of it. Uh, educated in Canada, a lot of these uh, uh, baby boomers were uh, educated uh, internationally. Uh, Canada for Ringo Lamb. Uh, Troy Hark uh, was educated uh, in college in the U.S. as well. Um, and that's interesting. I, I don't know. I, I can't say I'm going to say any deeper meaning to that, but it does show like a certain international nature. And of course, Hong Kong cinema uh, has always been very export oriented, even if it's just to the Chinese speaking audiences that are outside of Hong Kong, because of course the population of Hong Kong is not particularly large at all um, when you put it into sort of like this more global context. Um, he got his real start at Cinema City, uh, where he uh, directed a number of his early films were produced by them. Uh, probably the most kind of notable film that he directed for them, Aces Go Places 4, um, where he uh, he's kind of considered to be one of uh, the people that Karl Maka, who is one of the head people of Cinema City, took under his wing. Um, Karl Maka, also the star of uh, uh, Aces Go Places 4. So uh, just a little bit of background there. Um, uh, Cinema City, really interesting because they sort of have uh, both sides of the coin in John Wu, uh, doing A Better Tomorrow and City on Fire, which came a little bit after and kind of showcases a totally different style that is more unique um, to Ringo Lamb. Of course, John Woo's style is a little more well-known, but I think Ringo Lamb's is equally great in its own way. And so I think he's a film director that's always going to be kind of associated with John Woo and Quentin Tarantino. Um, and he's very different from, from uh, both of those directors, but especially John Woo uh, being his kind of contemporary. Um, John Woo... Uh, you know, I love John Woo. I think John Woo is fantastic. I think he brings a level of consistency that if you just look at those films, film by film of Ringo Lamb versus John Woo, I think John Woo probably wins um, because he's just so consistent and almost all of his films are at least quite good. Um, and Ringo Lamb, I mean, if we're being honest, I think there are a couple duds there, but John Woo can often get uh, very goofy in a way, stylized to the point of being almost a little silly. Um, we think about like his dub, uh, dub fetish and all of the slow-mo and stuff like that. Um, and Ringo, you could call him a lot of things, but you would never call him a goof. 
Uh, Ringo Lamb's films are anything but that, especially the best of his work. Um, okay, so yeah, I would definitely say Ringo Lamb is definitely one of the uh, absolute best filmmakers to come out of that sort of generation of Hong Kong, which has a lot of great filmmakers. Um, his golden era, I think, is a little bit narrower than a lot of those film, uh, those his contemporaries, and I think it really uh, most people will define it as 1987 to 1997. Uh, with the handover, Full Alert kind of considered his last uh, great film, uh, and starting with City on Fire, which is his first great film and really famous for being riffed on by Tarantino in Reservoir Dogs. Um, yeah, so during this golden period, 87 to 97, uh, he directed 14 films in 10 years. So he's working extremely fast during this time. I'd kind of say that's the first era of his uh, sort of filmmaking. Uh, the second was 97 to 2003. He has a couple Hollywood films in this time with John claude Van Damme, slowing down just a little bit, but working. And then he stopped for a while uh, in order to raise his family. Very respectable decision. Um, he does eventually, he does direct kind of this weird segment of Triangle. I'm not going to talk about that on this one. That's a very interesting project that I don't think totally works. Um, but then he comes back and directs Wild City and, and uh, Sky and Fire in uh, 2015 and 2016, I believe. Um, films I'm not particularly a fan of. I will discuss that later. Um, and before he unfortunately passes away. So he kind of has like this really, really fertile, uh, fruitful period where I think his best work came out of. Then he has a period that's a little bit lesser, and then he really just has that big gap um, before he directs those final two films. Um, yeah, I'd say overall kind of a lower hit rate than uh, than John Woo, but he has some films, um, School and Fire, for instance, that I would absolutely put um, personally ranking above anything that even John Woo has done. And I think that film has har is hard hitting and has a lot of social commentary. Um, and hits so many different spots in a way that uh, John Woo's films often uh, do not. So not to hate on Woo or anything, but uh, I'm personally glad to have both of these filmmakers, and I think they're both great. All right, so if we were to look at sort of the characteristics of what makes a Ringo Lamb film, especially the ones that he's really known for, um, for me, at least, I would say that his number one quality is just like this crazy, explosive thing. Uh, nature to it. It's much like an athlete and it feels much like a young person's energy. Um, he is not afraid of social criticism. Um, so many people have described uh, School on Fire in particular as incendiary. Um, and it very much feels like, um, especially those On Fire trilogy, feels like films that are his personal um, you can feel the passion behind that. And there's a certain like kinetic, dangerous uh, nature behind that. Uh, Bill Simmons uh, always talks about John Morant in the way that, uh, who is a basketball player, in a way that he is a, um, he's kind of like a freak of nature and he's just always attacking, attacking, attacking to the point where it feels dangerous and you feel like he might get hurt. And I almost feel the same way about Ringo Lamb. You might think that's a weird analogy to make, but there's something about those really early films of Ringo and the way he shows violence, shows people hitting the ground, shows people being tossed over the railings that's extremely chaotic and it just feels painful and potentially quite dangerous. And he brings that energy to, uh, to the film in a way that the hyper stylized John Woo, I think, just gives a totally different feeling of more of like this very graceful bullet ballet um, compared to uh, just the hardcore grittiness uh, that you have um, in Ringo Lamb. Uh, I think his films also have a lot of social commentary in a genre setting, which is a personal favorite of mine. I love it. I, I love genre films. Genre films are my favorite, and I love it when they do have something to say. And I think Ringo often does have something to say, especially when he is so young. Um, and, and I think in some ways uh, you could say, oh, he went downhill because of the handover and stuff like this. But I think in many ways uh, his best qualities uh, were a younger person's qualities uh, during that time. And, when it, and, and his films are the most effective when that is being channeled in, into his work. Um, and the last thing is he's just a really good filmmaker. And he has some really good hard-hitting set pieces in all of his movies that kind of have what I was just describing of that, like really chaotic, dangerous nature. And even in some of his lesser films, you can see moments where you're like, oh yeah, we're, we're back in a Ringo Lamb film. So even if the film doesn't totally work, there can be one or two set pieces uh, that really, really do come together. Even stuff I don't particularly like, like The Adventures or uh, Aces Go Places 4, those films have some great set pieces um, that are absolutely worth seeking out. 
Um, so it's interesting to think um, just kind of if you were even to subdivide that first uh, period of Hong Kong with him, he does kind of get older and you feel him aging a little bit as they go on. And Full Alert, often considered his last great film, um, is the film that uh, kind of is, uh, it, it, it's a lot less angry, uh, it, or at least it feels a lot less angry and it feels a little more mature than his on fire films do at least. Um, yeah, and, and in that sense too, I think he's the hardest to see functioning in the Hong Kong cinema that we see today that um, is a lot slicker, um, a lot more polished in terms of just overall look uh, and sleek uh, in terms of stuff like Infernal Affairs. His films, Ringo Lamb's films of his golden period just don't feel like that and they feel very, very different. Uh, even John Woo, I, I do feel like you can sort of see how he could make a contemporary Hong Kong film, uh, but Ringo Lamb feels forever in this like uh, late 80s, uh, 90s period. At least that's how I feel about it, at least. Um, okay, so uh, I put all the Ringo Lamb films uh, that I've seen into a couple into categories. For me, there are four that are pretty meh, four that are okay, four that are good, solidly good, and five I'd say start to get really good, and two that I consider to be great and all-time classics. Uh, yeah. Okay, so meh. Uh, so these are the ones that just don't really work for me. I would say none of these films I absolutely hate or dislike. Uh, totally, but there's something that just doesn't quite work. Um, so, Replicant, In Hell, Wild City, and Sky and Fire. So, two John claude Van Dams. I'm just not a big John claude Van Damme fan. For me, um, I wish Ringo had directed something in Hong Kong uh, with uh, one of the stars out there for it, for either of those films. Uh, I hope he got paid well. Um, these films, they have some moments. I think Replicant kind of has a cool a premise uh, in hell has you get to bring Ringo back to a prison setting. They're okay. Uh, I just don't love them. Um, so for me, it's pretty mad. Uh, even the action uh, in his uh, his Hollywood work or his Western work, it just they're just not that. It's, it's just not the same. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes to maybe working in an unfamiliar environment with less infrastructure. I think maybe the one he has the most is one I will talk about in just a minute or two. And Wild City and Sky and Fire, um, kind of like I was just saying, it's like his uh, his uh, his energy is of a distinct uh, early period and it does feel like a younger person. He directed both of these films, I believe, in his 60s, so he's getting to be much, much older at that point and probably more mature. Uh, but, uh, it's, I, I think he would have, um, I, I would have been curious to see what else he would have directed at this time, but I, I do think that these films, um, while he does try to recreate some of that, those energies, they just don't feel like, uh, Ringo Lamb's films in the way that the earlier work does. So, uh, I don't hate them, uh, they just don't totally work for me, and some of the CG and just the overall look of them, uh, are just not, they're just not great for me. Okay. Uh, so now into the just okay category. Um, so I think a lot of these films in this category um, do start to feel like a Ringo Lamb film, uh, just highly flawed and oftentimes a little bit long in the tooth or uh, just uh, just kind of off in a certain way. So here I have Undeclared War, Adventures, Maximum Intact, uh, Aces Go Places 4. Uh, Maximum Impact, uh, probably my favorite of the John claude Van Dams, just a little bit better action and stuff like that. Uh, again, I, I'm not a huge Van Damme guy, so uh, for me, it was like this might be amongst my more favorite Van Dams, just because I'm not even much of a fan of his. Uh, I much prefer sort of the uh, Hong Kong action. Um, Aces Go Places 4 is quite interesting in a way, uh, because you do start to see the just a little bit of strands of, oh, that feels like Ringo, that feels like Ringo, especially in the set pieces. So those not familiar, Ace of Go Places is a Hong Kong franchise done by Cinema City. They did five films, um, very uh, kind of like slapstick Hong Kong humor, uh, stuff that doesn't really work for me. And maybe that's part of the reason I like uh, the really angry Ringo Lamb films because I do get those emotions and I get that stuff a lot more than I get the comedy. Um, so Ace of Go Places 4, uh, just not that, just not quite for me. Um, the set pieces I like, uh, the rest of it I could do without, more or less. 
Um, but solid, uh, solid watch if you like Hong Kong humor or if you've already seen uh, 10 Ringo Lamb films and you want to see something else. Uh, this one predates City on Fire, so you can really just sort of see uh, the promise of him as a filmmaker in it if you uh, kind of go from his uh, best work uh, just a couple of years later back to that. Um, the, there's some explosions and some uh, highway chase scenes and stuff like that just that do really much feel like Ringo. Uh, personally, I think the action in it is better than Maximum Impact, but what do I know? I'm I, I'm a John Con Van Dam hater apparently. Um, okay, and Adventures and Undeclared War in the '90s. Um, these films are fine. Uh, I just don't think they uh, come together quite so well. Undeclared War is quite ambitious, trying to be an international production, um, and I don't think the English language stuff necessarily works that well. And Adventures is uh, simply 111 minutes, so it's a little too long. Uh, it doesn't necessarily feel that uh, like people are having a good time, but there are moments where it does uh, bring a lot of um, action and interesting stuff to it. Overall, as a film, though, I think it's a little bit of a mess um, for me to uh, rate too highly. Uh, so for me, they are interesting, but not great. All right, so next up I have uh, C. These are good films that um, just don't quite make it to the upper echelon of Ringo's work. I got Prison on Fire 2, Touch and Go, uh, The Suspect, and Burning Paradise. Um, okay, so Prison on Fire 2, a uh, really nice sequel. I think it's quite underrated. Um, I don't think a ton of people have seen this film, but if you like the original, I definitely think Prison on Fire 2 ha captures maybe like 75% of the appeal of the uh, first one and does have some like uh, just extreme uh, violence and great set pieces towards the end of it. Um, so good, solid, Chalian and fat vehicle. Uh, Touch and Go um, is the Sammo Hung, Ringo Lam uh, collaboration, and it pretty much feels exactly like that. Um, I think it doesn't quite come together in a super satisfying way, but it has its moments, has some solid action. Um, the humor I could kind of do without, but um, it's fine. It, it's good. It's an entertaining time. You'll forget it probably pretty quickly. Uh, the Suspect, which I think has a lot of interesting aspects. I think The Suspect mainly suffers from having a Louis Koo that's not quite ready for the spotlight here. Um, it stars him in the leading role. Um, I'm a big Louis Koo fan, but uh, this is 1999, I believe, and he is not quite ready uh, for the spotlight in that same way. Uh, and the last one, Burning Paradise. So Burning Paradise is probably the one that I would consider uh, bumping up, and I do really need to reevaluate at some point. So I saw this film for the first time, I think, uh, three or four months ago, and it's a fascinating film, and, and it feels very unlike uh, just about anything Ringo Lamb has done mainly because it is a wuxia. Uh, so it is a period film uh, from a director not at all known for his uh, period films. Um, and at the same time, it has his fingerprints all over it. Um, so that's why it's such an interesting watch um, uh, because there's um, just, it, it's very dark and it's very violent. Uh, and it's, it'd be a fascinating, fascinating uh, double bill, perhaps too much of a double bill with, with uh, the blade, uh, Tro Troy Hark's The Blade, um, kind of from that same era. Um, so yeah, this film produced by Troy Hark, and I do really need to rewatch it. There's something about it that just didn't quite connect to me, but uh, perhaps kind of coming back to it, um, I, I, I wonder if I would like it uh, a little more because I do remember some pretty kick-ass action and uh, and sort of that like violence. And in, in other ways, this is also a prison film too. Uh, and I do love me a Ringo Lamb prison film, if it doesn't have John Claude Van Damme. Uh, okay, so now I will go to my top seven. So the lower part of the top seven is the really good films. Um, so films that uh, are fantastic and really, um, I don't think I'm underrating any of these really. I, I think these are really good films. And I think depending on who you ask, these could be amongst the uh be even number one or number two on some people's Ringo Lamb list. So I got Full Contact, Full Alert, Wild Search, City on Fire, and Twin Dragons. Twin Dragons, probably going to be the most controversial. Um, this is uh, Ringo's Jackie Chan, uh, Troy Hark uh, collaboration, and it does feel a lot like that. Uh, so it's kind of like touch and go, but with Jackie Chan instead. Um, and you might say this is too high. For me, I have the most mixed feelings because this one 
feels less like a Ringo Lamb film uh, than maybe some of his other films or just about any other film that I'm making this high. But I'll be honest, I really enjoy this film. Uh, Hong Kong humor for me is sometimes hit or miss. And for me, this, this film works and I like it. It's got some fun action. So I just had a great time with this film. Uh, I could see it maybe going down uh, in my estimation at some point, but um, for me at least, uh, I, I thought this film was a lot of fun. So uh, there, it'd probably be number seven on this list if I'm being honest, but I still like it a lot. Um, Full Contact um, is probably his most uh, John Woo-like in terms of plot. It's very over the top, uh, very, uh, very crazy and wonderful in a good way. I think there's certainly some flaws and some dated aspects to it, but uh, I think this is a film that <clears throat> If you are into the things that this film gives you, this could be someone's uh, favorite Hong Kong film. Uh, so you got like a great Chow Yun Fat uh, really dialing it up and Simon Yim who is dialing it up to an even uh, another level. So this film is just extremely colorful. They go to Southeast Asia, uh, incredibly uh, tons of chaos ensues. Um, yeah, really, really fun film. Um, and definitely, um, probably, uh, probably one with less social commentary than Ringo's other films, but a really good genre film. Full Alert, I uh, talked about this a bit. Uh, it hints a little bit more at a procedural nature, um, stuff that would become a little bit more um, popular in Hong Kong uh, in the uh, following uh, decade. Um, and it's just a, a solid thriller. Wild Search um, is kind of uh, Ringo uh, combining a lot of his earlier work, but then also making sort of this romance. And I really dug this film. I know this film is a little bit controversial amongst Ringo fans. And I think part of that is because it's kind of tricky to know what to expect. I actually saw this film early in my Ringo watching, and so I didn't necessarily come in with those same expectations. Um, but I think it has um, a lot of great elements. It's a great leading Chow Yun Fat performance, and it's a nice one if you want to see something that is uh, familiar, but also a little different. So Eureka did a great uh, Blu-ray release of this, um, as well as Full Alert. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this one is well worth checking out and definitely underseen. Uh, City on Fire probably needs no introduction. I did a review on this uh, as well. It's, it's, it's just a classic, uh, well, maybe not quite classic, but close to classic uh, Hong Kong um, undercover cop film. Uh, Tarantino took a lot from it and you can sort of see why uh, the plot construction and stuff like that is really simple concept but it works really well. Great leading performances by Chow Yun Fat, Danny Lee. Um, okay, so final category, the upper uh, part of the pyramid, fantastic, the classics. For me, this is Prison on Fire and School on Fire and School on Fire for me is in particular the all-timer on this list. Um, I've talked about all the, both of these films on separate reviews, so if you want to hear more about them, uh, check that out. But these films are both um, great. Uh, Prison on Fire has some great interactions with uh, Big Tony Leung and Chow Yun Fat, uh, really uh, young Big Tony. And School on Fire um, just, uh, it just is just, for me at least, uh, I find it to be deeply impactful. All of these on fire trilogies are taking aim at. Um, they have social commentary baked into them, and they, in particular, take aim at the systems. School and Fire, in particular, really, really got quite a reaction out of the locals there. Um, and so, uh, and understandably so, I mean, taking aim at the schools and stuff like that. So, um, very, very product provocative films and films that I find to be extremely effective. They both have incredible, bombastic, violent conclusions that I think are some of my absolute favorites. And they just leave me uh, kind of with my jaw down. And it's like, wow, these are these are just some, uh, some really great films. Okay, well, I think that wraps up my uh, Ringo Lamb um, uh, discussion. So let me know how you rank Ringo's films, uh, if you differ from my list or if you kind of come to a similar place as far as those films. I think my, for the most part my film, my list is fairly conventional but maybe one or two um, off the cuff, uh, maybe slightly slight differences there. Um, but yeah, uh, check out the films of Ringo Lamb. Highly recommend um, especially anything in that top seven. So thank you all for tuning in. I will see you all next time.